and welcome everyone to our monthly WFO webinar. My name is Ilya Kranulkov and I'm the Senior Development Manager at the World Forum of Showwind. Today's WFO webinar is a reflection on of Showwind market developments in 2021. Uh, it's my great pleasure to welcome our three excellent speakers today. We have Marko Vydek, Vice President of Business Development at Principal Power. We have uh, Holger Grubel, the Head of, the, of Portfolio Development of Showwind at ENBW. And we have Javier Magro, a Business Unit Manager at DEMI Offshore Group. And before we jump into the presentation, let me tell you a few things about uh, WFO. The organization uh, was started in 2018, um, so we are around three years old, and we're a nonprofit entity focused exclusively on offshore wind. Um, that's what we do. We have an international setup offices in Hamburg, Tokyo, Taipei, and New York. Uh, in terms of our activities, it's very straightforward as we focus on three things. Uh, we lobby for offshore wind around the world, we inform about offshore wind um, via various media channels, and we connect the global offshore wind community but by doing uh, various events such as like this webinar. And in terms of members, we're very happy to have over 75 global members from all segment, segments of offshore wind value chain representing North America, Europe, Asia, and even Australia. And if somehow you're still not a member of WFO, please uh, join us and you are free to contact me or our managing director, Gunnar Herzig. Uh, and if you have any questions, please feel free uh, to reach us. Then a few words about the structure of this webinar, which is very simple. During the first half of the webinar, um, um, Holger, Marco and Javier will present on the topic. And during the sec second part of the webinar, we have a Q&A session. And you have a control panel on your entrance site. So please use the chat function to submit your question to the speakers today. So without any further ado, Marco, I'm sharing the screen with you. And the floor is yours. Okay, <clears throat> thank you, Ilya. I think everyone can see my screen now. If you can confirm that, because I can yes. cannot see it myself. Yes. Okay. Very good. So, yeah, thank you for the opportunity to uh, tell you a little bit uh, more about Principal Power and what we've been doing last year and what we're doing uh, to prepare for the next challenge in uh, in floating offshore uh, wind is of course the industrializations we have uh, now uh, executed a couple of uh, pre-commercial uh, projects which i will uh, show you in uh, in a little bit and what we've seen of course in the in the bottle fix industry is the uh, the way towards uh, scaling up uh, the wind farms is what floating wind now is uh, is ready for so i'll give you a little bit of an, uh, a flavor of uh, our company history a technology provider of uh, of floating wind of course uh, very much at the at the start of this is industry uh, as an enabler of, of offshore floating wind so of course we're very proud to uh, to see where we are now as an industry clearly getting a lot of uh, attention now from uh, from from the offshore wind uh, industry also the supply chain uh, keeping an, a keen eye on what's uh, what's going on and the potential of um, of helping in uh, in creating this uh, building up the supply chain for for floating offshore wind and especially in terms of uh, industrialization so I'll tell a little bit about a wind float for the people who are not familiar with it and i'll show you of some operational uh, wind float projects that we have now uh, operating in uh, off the coast of uh, portugal uh, and as well since this year also operating in uh, off the coast of aberdeen the king card uh, projects and i will tell you a little bit about of what we are learning from these projects and what we're uh, applying in, in from these past projects into our new uh, designs and uh, conclude with a couple of uh, conclusions so here we are a bit of a timeline of the uh, of the company so principal power incorporated in 2007 uh, developing the uh, the design in 2008 we had the uh, the wave testing of uh, of the first uh, wind float scale uh, model 
And in 2011, we created the first opportunity in Portugal to, uh, yeah, to implement an, uh, a demonstration uh, project, which was the, uh, the Windflow One. And she had a two megawatt turbine uh, on, the, on the substructure. So through these years, we uh, were able to gather data and, uh, and show that the technology is, uh, is working, which uh, then uh, was continued by the uh, King Cardine phase one. I cannot completely see my own uh, screen. Okay, yeah, the two megawatts. So this, the unit of the wind float one was uh, reused on King Cardine. Basically this was to, uh, to help reaching the uh, milestone in, uh, for the project in, uh, of King Cardine to meet the, uh, the ROC uh, requirements in, in Scotland to produce electric uh, power. So that's how we continued uh, gathering experience with, uh, with the first uh, wind float. Okay, and then we uh, started continuing with the uh, the first pre-commercial one, Windflow Atlantic projects, which consists of uh, three units. Uh, the first project that was uh, bank finance with the uh, with the European uh, Bank, and then of course uh, the King Garden project uh, itself, which uh, which followed with uh, five uh, units uh, equipped with the, uh, the the nine and a half Vestas uh, turbines. So next project that we are working on is the one in, uh, in France, in the Mediterranean, which is the uh, EFTL uh, projects that will see uh, three units uh, with 10 megawatts uh, turbines. So you can see already or hear already the, uh, the increase in, the, in, in turbine size that we are deploying on the, uh, on the wind load. So the wind load, I mentioned it a couple of times. So I, I assume most people understand what it looks like. Three column connected with uh, with braces, uh, semi-submersible uh, structure. Key features are, of course, that it's uh, wind turbine uh, agnostics. So we have worked with the uh, with almost all the turbine suppliers in the, in the market. Uh, of course, we have the most experience with uh, with Vestas because uh, Vestas turbines are installed on the projects in in Portugal as well as in uh, in uh, Aberdeen in the, on the Kincardine one. And uh, if we look at item B, the damping plates, this helps dampening the movements of, uh, of any induced uh, wave uh, motions. So this uh, allows us to, uh, to implement viscous uh, damping on the, on the platform and reduce the, uh, the movements, uh, which allows us, of course, to also keep the dimensions of the, of the turbine uh, smaller. Then an uh, important feature of the platform is the smart hull uh, trim uh, system, which allows us to uh, displace uh, water between the three columns. And that uh, is very handy for accommodating of the, uh, the high energy uh, events. You can imagine what, uh, what happens when the, uh, the wind direction starts to, uh, to change or when the, there is no wind and the turbine needs to shut off or, or, or turn on. Uh, this creates a lot of yeah, high energy events, which uh, movements uh, that are initiated by that needs to comp be compensated. And we use that with uh, displacing water from one column to the, to the other. So this also allows to uh, keep the dimensions of the platform uh, to a minimum. And what it also does is allow to, to tune the platform while it's in operations to make sure that the, uh, the surface that the, uh, the blades are uh, spinning in is perpendicular to the, to the wind. So this helps increasing the, uh, the, uh, the power production of the, uh, of the wind farm. Uh, maybe it's only a, a, a small amount in percentages, but of course over the lifetime of a wind farm, the wind farm, this can make a huge uh, difference. So a, a clear benefit of the, uh, of the smart hole trim, trim system. And then of course, we also have the passive ballast system just to uh, keep the, uh, the bottom of each column and um, and have it at the uh, achieve the uh, the operating draft at location, but also use it at the key site where we do the integration of the uh, the turbines um, on the platform onshore. So here you see a little bit of the project in uh, in Portugal, north of Portugal, three uh, three units, two uh, that you can see in the uh, in the video. Uh, operating now uh, already for quite some time and the last announcement was there that uh, it was uh, 75 gigawatts already uh, product electricity production in the first year 
as I mentioned, uh, this wind farm is equipped with uh, three uh, Vestas uh, units, uh, 8.3 megawatt uh, turbine power. Uh, water depth 95 meters, 20 kilometers offshore. So you're still able to see them from, from the shore at this, uh, at this location. And of course, designed for the North Atlantic uh, weather conditions, uh, classified by ABS. Uh, this uh, uh, wind farm was built in, uh, in a dry dock. I will come to that in uh, in a bit because, of course, with the increasing size of turbines, uh, the dry docks will become too small to uh, to allow this. And we're also looking at implementing design changes, which allows uh, a modularized approach of fabricating the the platforms. Uh, of course, as part of the industrialization process, so not all these units need to be produced at the at, at the same location. It can be uh, fabricated in different locations and assembled at uh, closer to the site. So, like I said, commissioned and started up in 2020. Here, an idea of the uh, King Gardine offshore wind farm. Actually, a, a video that I took myself when I was uh, out uh, there in September this year. Uh, really impressive uh, to see when you're on uh, uh, on a boat that uh, that moves uh, up and down, and you see how stable the complete platform uh, is with the turbine on top spinning. So. Uh, amazing to see this in, uh, in operating in in real life, and I think this this view is shared by, by all the people that were uh, that were on board. So it clearly helps how to show how how feasible the floating offshore wind uh, has become, and uh, yeah, are ready to uh, to make the next step to the, the bigger size wind farms. Uh, so, like I said, five uh, five units uh, already uh, bigger uh, megawatt, nine and a half uh, megawatt. Uh, water depth here was 70 meters and 15 kilometers offshore, so also still relatively close. Uh, again, classification society ABS. It was a very fast tracked uh, project, uh, so it uh, it did not allow to find maybe the, the most efficient project execution plan for the project. But we had to be uh, fast because of uh, yeah what what happened in the uh, in the implementation of the project. We were uh, introduced at a late phase in the in, in the project to use the uh, the wind float. So we really had to find the uh, the fastest execution plan uh, possible. So which meant uh, fabrication in uh, in southern Europe and do the uh, the integration of the turbine in, uh, in in Rotterdam and then tow them out to uh, to Aberdeen. Uh, of course, when we would have more time to uh, to think about project execution plan, we would would be able to create more local content. But in this case, given the uh, condensed uh, project execution plan or timeline, we have to be uh, be quick, and, uh, and this is why it has been executed uh, like it was. So yeah, successful installation, commissioned and started up in 2021. So yeah, very uh, exciting to see the next uh, wind farm in uh, in operation, of course. So here we go. What did we learn from these uh, two key projects for, for principal power? Uh, when we look at the design method and the project execution plan, uh, as mentioned, uh, at the interface between the floating foundation designer and the turbine provider is very critical and needs to be uh, started at an early phase. Uh, I think people can imagine that uh, a turbine on top of a bottom fixed foundation is very different than on a floating foundation. There's a lot of designing that needs to be done, uh, coupled analysis between the, the substructure and, and the turbine, which has a very uh, intense interface between the turbine provider and the flotation designer, like, like principal power. Uh, as I mentioned in Hawking Cardine, early engagement from the supply chain to uh, to inform the project constraints and the installation philosophy. This is what we do in our uh, in our studies. Of course, we design the platform for uh, for the mid ocean conditions, as well as the turbine size. But we also uh, need to understand what are the uh, the project drivers, local content constraints. Uh, cost reductions uh, and allowing us to have an, or take a holistic view on uh, on that we can take these uh, things in, into consideration. Just to highlight that the the wind float is not is it you should not see it as a product but it's a technical solution. So we can uh, can tailor a lot during the design process to take certain uh, project drivers or, or constraints from the local uh, local content. 
um, also from in terms of uh, assembly sites, uh, water adapted key sites, we can take this into consideration during design and find the best solution for uh, for the project. So of course the other thing is the use of empirical data that we're now gathering from uh, from the projects that we have in execution, and that of course helps us to uh, to validate and calibrate numerical model uh, models. And of course, also challenge safety factors with the class society based on uh, yeah, our real life uh, experience. So yeah, this helps, of course, to take uh, any redundancy out of uh, of the projects. In terms of the design, uh, as I mentioned, the first generations were built in uh, in one place. Um, what we are doing now in our latest designs, we uh, we are optimizing the column structural configuration. So we try to minimize the steel weight and and the complexity for the for the manufacturers. Uh, another good example is the uh, simplification of the truss connections. In the early phases, the connections of the braces with the columns were inside the uh, inside the columns. What we're, doing, what we're doing now is bringing these connections outside the, the columns, so which allows the, the, the truss frames to be fabricated in a different place than the, the columns and bring these elements uh, together uh, at an assembly site and, uh, and assemble it. So this is an example of how we can uh, modularize in the fabrication of the, uh, of the wind float. So we're uh, improving and uh, trying to simplify the uh, the damping plates that you can see here in the, in the drawing at the bottom of the of the columns. So also there we try to uh, improve and make it simpler to manufacture. And then of course we're also looking at the access uh, philosophy, so boat landings and lay down area optimization. So this is all related to the fact that uh, yeah any kind of uh, improvement that you can make. On one platform, of course, will apply to all the other platforms. So small improvements can have a big effect on the on the overall uh, project. Then moving on to the uh, the operations or the the integration. So integration process uh, with the experience that we have, we achieved a lot of reduction in the integration uh, time uh, through the experience on the King Cardine uh, project. So this all helps in uh, in optimizing the project uh, time schedule. Also, in terms of the platform hookup uh, offshore, with the experience that we have uh, now, we uh, we have managed to uh, really improve on the uh, installation time uh, offshore, and uh, the same for the platform pre-commissioning uh, and commissioning it uh, itself at the fabrication yard. These experiences that we have all help to uh, to improve the uh, the design and the operational uh, procedures that we uh, that we implement in uh, in principal power. So last uh, last slide uh, conclusions. <coughs> Wind float is uh, as you've seen from the presentation. It's a proven technology and has demonstrated that it's uh, cost effective and utility, utility scale ready. Uh, the industrialization, as I mentioned, it's a reality now and principal power is uh, is well positioned for to to implement that uh, to uh, make these utility scale um, um, wind farms uh, ready. 75 megawatts of uh, of floating wind installed now in 2021, and as I mentioned, with the uh, the key learnings that we are integrating now in the uh, the new projects and, and the future designs. So yeah, utility scale project success is reliant on uh, leveraging the experience that we gained on, on the projects that we have, and uh, as I mentioned, we really need now to cooperate with the uh, with the supply chain to. Uh, to learn from each other what uh, what does the uh, the fabrication the yards uh, need to do to be able to build these uh, float units in, in serial productions and also we can learn from these fabricators uh, any comments on, on our design to see what can be uh, improved so this is something that we are in, uh, involved in uh, very much at the moment and of course, these industrialized solutions uh, will bring a lot uh, to uh, to bring down the LSOE of these uh, of the floating uh, wind farms. So I think that's. I think I used my uh, my time. Um, that was a lot to me. So I'd like to pass it on to the to the next one. Excellent. Thank you very much, Mark. This is very comprehensive overview of the wind float uh, projects. Yeah, thank you very much. And now it's my great pleasure to introduce our next speaker, uh, Holger Grubel. Uh, Holger, over to you. 
Yeah, thank you very much. Um, I hope this is the right screen that you can see. Yes. Wonderful. Um, well, thank you very much for uh, for having me here. Thank you very much for all the participants out there that um, joined this webinar. Um, it's um, I've been asked to share some reflections of what has happened in the past year, and I think um, it's fair to say that the year 21 was uh, actually quite a, a busy one, despite all the issues that has kept us working more from home than we probably would have liked to. But it, it, in the end, has turned out to be quite a successful year, at least for us and for the overall business as such. Um, sharing some some views on what we have done, um, I think we we have have been extremely happy at EMBW um, with the result of um, our project Hydrate. We are still on route to zero subsidy, um, which is basically uh, following up on a, on a promise that we gave in 2017 when we participated in the first German offshore wind auction and uh, submitted a one of the first of its kind, a zero subsidy bid, um, deliver, delivering or promising to deliver a project which uh, would go without any, any commitment, any binding subsidies from the government. Um, this year we've taken this one massive step forward. We have agreed on a turbine supply contract and have agreed uh, with Vestas to uh, find the turbines for um, for our projects. That's a 50 megawatt turbine, 236 meter rotor diameter. So um, massive equipment that we will be installing in the heat rate project. We're very much looking forward to be one of the first customers or the first customer to really use that large turbine on an industrial scale. Um, big step for EMBW will increase our our generation capacity in general, our wind capacity in specific um, quite dramatically, but um, certainly not the end. Um, in January this year, we have been successfully securing a three gigawatt project um, in the Irish Sea, and um, and that was obviously uh, quite a big step for us. Three gigawatts, uh, just to give you give you an indication where we where we come from. For for a utility like EBW, this is almost 25% capacity boost um, for our company. So it's quite a massive step, and we will we will develop this um, quite diligently in the next coming years. Three gigawatts is um, is exactly two sites that we have been securing in the IRC, and um, and we hope to get um, both of these projects online before the end of. Um, of this decade. It's fair to say that, that we've paid quite a substantial um, fee for this for this um, option. Um, it's a development in the market that we've seen coming in the last few years. So it's um, just to be very clear, it's not a market premium that we have um, completed, but rather saying this is the business that we understand where we see the project are developing to the extent that they are commercially viable and that they find an environment which allows these projects to contribute substantially to the energy demand of the various countries. One element for us to be successful was actually also in the IRC to, to find a partner. And, um, and this creating a partnership uh, was something that has kept us very much busy over the last um, 12 months. And despite the fact that we were pretty much um, all throughout the year in lockdown and couldn't uh, move around, we have been quite happily and successfully coordinating our activities with, with various partners, just to name a few of them, with our partner BP in the UK, but also in, in France, where we have pre-qualified with um, Shelley Olfi on the one hand side and uh, CDC Casa de Pau, um, for a an auction on, actually as a matter of fact, two auctions for floating offshore projects in, um, in both South Brittany and then subsequently in the Mediterranean. Um, these partnerships will, will be vital for us. Um, the projects will increase in size, will, will be quite relevant to find the best competence, best skills uh, that you could find to, um, to join forces. And we believe that's important to have a bundle of opportunities that um, would allow you to be active in the market. Hence, this partnership approach is a, is a quite relevant asset for us to be successful there. And we're quite, quite up happy that, that this year, despite the, um, the situation that we're in, has been quite a successful year in making sure that these partnerships are viable, are um, strong and, and can basically can give us the support that we would need to actually develop these projects further. 
that was basically the, the snapshot of, of what we have done. Um, but I think our industry itself is 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 moving on uh, with quite a dramatic speed, and um, uh, you can see that on on this slide. We have we have, despite any any impacts from pandemics, we have been seeing continuous trends with new developers joining the industry, um, and they will continue to join the industry and and will ex expand their role um, from 2020 onwards, um, and so 22 onwards, and. Um, and the targets for for offshore wind will be increased. What you can see here on the slides, actually not a slide that we have done, uh, but rather giving some market intelligence on where the where the individual targets of the respective um, countries um, regions have been developing. You can see that uh, when today, almost today in 2020, there was there was few capacity available. We're talking sort of um, less than um, than 40 gigawatts that we have installed by today. Uh, we will see by the by the end of um, of this decade um, quite a dramatic increase, which is the green column in the various in the various region. Um, and these are the targets that the respective governments has, have set for themselves, and will try to provide a framework, a regulatory framework that will enable this growth. Um, and um, and will it will change the industry quite dramatically because so far we have been developing offshore wind as a as a very small business compared to other industries and um, and it's suddenly ramping up on, on with a dramatic scale and uh, it will provide a huge opportunity for developers but also a huge challenge to actually develop these projects find grid access and uh, secure the the um, supplies for these industries the the route continues uh, and that's basically the Hopefully, for everybody to be um, visible, the purple color that you can see there. Um, those are the individual targets for the respective regions. If you go beyond 2030, um, and you can see that this this pathway continues. And um, and some um, people, GWEC does not believe that this is going to be the end of the story. But we see an ever increasing demand, an ever increasing pipeline um, that will further develop uh, offshore wind. Again, this will this will pose some immediate challenge for the industry to grow on the developer side, but also very much on the supplier side. This this development has been has been supported in the last um, year very much through the discussion that was happening in Glasgow uh, at the COP26, where. Um, I would not. I would not go as far as saying that that uh, everybody can be happy or satisfied with the results coming out of the COP26. But um, it, there were definitely some major uh, takeaways from that conference, um, uh, committing to a global understanding of that the global warming needs to be uh, needs to be contained at 1.5 degrees. That there should be a further increase of the support scheme for the developing countries. And um, and there should be a um, revisiting of the current national or country specific plans to ever increase the um, the effort to reduce CO2 emissions. So the demand itself will have many many um, elements, many many stones that we need to actually turn around and see how we can build a an economy that will help us to cut down on CO2 emissions. We will definitely see, and I guess that that is the most relevant aspect. We will see more renewables coming, and that is that is certainly clear for all the technologies, all the renewable technologies that we have at hand. Um, and offshore wind plays a major role in that, which is which is something new because we're we're still compared to PV or or um, onshore wind. It's a fairly small business, but nevertheless, the growth rates are are still very very high in them, and hence the role of offshore wind is increasingly important. That demand will need to be met by a supply chain, and um, and therefore the supply chain itself will need to um, cope with the situation and create a more industrialization process so that that the industry can actually deliver it to um, the requirement of cheap of low cost um, renewables coming to the market. We'll see new technologies develop, developing and. Um, and uh, as Marco presented, floating is, is one of them, and I could have focused on floating, floating but um, obviously Marco has, has um, stormed the show there. So therefore, um, there's other technologies that we will be seeing. And one could be 
uh, one could be um, green hydrogen. We will definitely see some development where the electricity is actually moving into um, into other sectors and other other elements. And, and green hydrogen is definitely something that we will be seeing as as um, developing. And you can see here the the chart that displays that the target from the EU to actually deliver green hydrogen by the year 2030, which is really ambitious, is it cannot be met by by um, just simply adding the individual targets of the individual countries in the EU. So there will be, there will continue to be a push for bringing renewables into segments that are um, beyond the pure electricity sector. Now, what are the main elements of that um, for, for us, for our industry? If we want to build more offshore wind, and I, I speak from the developer perspective, I obviously see ourselves in a challenge, how can we actually deliver these offshore wind projects? And um, uh, and there's there are many buzzwords, and I just want to leave you with these buzzwords because I think these will be the buzzwords that we will continue to be hearing over the next years. Um, it will certainly be sort of a topic about interconnector hybrid con concepts. So far, we have pretty much everywhere where we build, we've been building offshore wind, we have a radial connection where you connect the wind farm with a direct line from, from the open sea to the closest um, land side. That is going to change. We will see interconnectors. These interconnectors will open um, up for, for offshore wind so that you will have uh, a, a number of wind farms connecting, maybe even through different countries. Um, and that is, that is going to be um, a challenge for in Europe. We cannot see uh, today how the regulatory framework would look like, but it's definitely something that we will be seeing coming if we want to deliver renewables in an efficient way. An element of that is, is um, energy islands. I've um, been quite vocal about this one uh, in the last few, um, few months, I'd say. Uh, Denmark being the first country that has been uh, targeting or, or um, tendering for an, for an energy island. But what does it actually mean? Who's allowed to connect to such an energy island? Who is, who's going to build that island? And, um, and what's the benefit to various countries that might be, might be actually connected to this island? That's going to be a challenge, and, um, and we're going to see some very, very interesting discussions, I would, I would assume, in the, last, uh, in the next few months. We'll see some, some interesting discussions of, um, about European bidding zones. I guess that is more typical to Europe and not so much for the rest of the world. We'll, we'll, see, we'll see the North Sea Basin with a number of neighboring countries, and I, I, would, I would assume that, that at some point in time, offshore wind farms will not solely be connecting to one country around the North Sea Basin, but rather they might deliver the energy to any of the neighboring country. It goes hand in hand with the concept of interconnectors and being able to have a very uh, robust network system, which allows you to be rather fail-proof when it comes to using the, the renewable energy source. I already mentioned the um, the take uh, the the um, yeah the radio connection versus the offshore grid. This this interconnector and, and getting the interconnectors into more an advanced system is basically the first cornerstone of, of actually delivering an offshore grid, which combines multiple offshore wind farms in the entire area of the North Sea Basin, but also beyond it. That is going to be the next challenge. And then obviously, as I already mentioned, um, if we cannot get find the way to grid access, it can also be uh, that we are producing electrons like um, power to X. And, um, and that will all be the, um, the questions whether if we can meet those challenges and find, find answers to these, then we will be also discussing whether our current EU targets are going to be the targets that we will be delivering towards or whether we'll extend um, that ambition even beyond those numbers. With that, thank you very much for your attention and um, be there for any questions, if there be any. Well, oh, great. Thank you very much, Holger, for this very insightful presentation about EMPW milestones, uh, including quite interesting discussion you brought about uh, offshore wind becoming more and more um, important um, aspect of, of the business. Also glad to hear that despite of the pandemic, um, um, the company did well uh, business-wise. That's great. So thank you. We'll be happy to discuss this in more detail during the Q&A session. Uh, and now it's my great um, pleasure to introduce our final speaker for tonight, uh, Javier Magro, 
Uh, Javier, over to you. Hello, everyone. Can you see my screen and do you hear me? Yes. Okay, thank you very much. Um, hello, everyone. Um, my name is Javier Magro. I'm a business manager for uh, Asia Pacific. And uh, yeah, the topic for this, uh, for this session was to talk about basically the reflections for the year 2021. And, and, and what I would like to focus is, since my part is, is more focusing on all the Asia Pacific uh, business, I would like to focus on the key topics and the key principles that we have been, um, we have been developing over the, over the last months here in, uh, in Asia Pacific region. And what we see is really important in order to, uh, to be successful in this area. So the first topic I would like to focus is offshore wind expertise. Um, and first, maybe to start there, I would like to have briefly uh, a couple of, of seconds explaining where are we coming from as a Demi Group. So Demi Group is a group of more than 150 years experience uh, marine construction. Uh, and since already more than 20 years ago, we are fully involved in activities related to offshore wind. Our capabilities cover every type of, of activities related to construction of offshore wind farms, including foundations, cables, turbine installation, rock placement, soil investigation. So all these activities, thanks to this wide range, we can proudly say that we have the longest and the most diverse track records in the market when talking about offshore winds. Uh, there is no better way to, to demonstrate this than with numbers. So here we are. Uh, for example, we have installed more than 2,700 turbines. We have installed more than 2,100 foundations, of which more than 1,900 are monopiles. Um, and, and this, of course, uh, it's, 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 uh, it's possible thanks to diversity and flexibility uh, in many ways. So uh, first of all, when we talk about diversity and flexibility, I would like to refer to a dedicated fleet. We have a wide uh, fleet of jack-up vessels, floating vessels, but also cable-laying vessels. Um, with, with, with this fleet, we can cover all the scopes I was referring at the beginning of the, of the presentation. Um, we can also adjust ourselves depending on the technical challenges of the different sites, uh, where we are in Europe or in uh, Asia Pacific or, or in US, for example, and also taking into account the different site conditions uh, and the conditions inside each country, which are very different, as you all know. So, when we talk about flexibility as well and diversity, it's not only related to the vessels, but it's also related to our commercial solutions that in the year 2021 we have, we have used uh, very well. And, and for example, in this regard, we have seen in this year major awards to DEME, uh, for example, in US, where we got the award of Balance of Plant Project, uh, together with other awards in the same country in US related to foundation installation or turbine installation. Uh, whereas, for example, in Euro, we got awards related to cable installation or in Taiwan, uh, awards also for foundation installation. This project in Taiwan specifically was signed already some time ago, but recently, a few days ago, the project reached financial close going into execution. So uh, the question is, how do we bring now all this experience and all this expertise in offshore wind? Uh, in 2021, what we have been doing, and, and again, focusing a bit more into the Asia Pacific region where I'm involved, um, the question is, how do we make sure that this experience is combined with what, in our opinion, is, is completely needed, local content? Uh, so let's talk about local content and how do we see this local content as a key item? Uh, this is mainly because we believe in what we call partnership approach and during the whole year 2021 we have definitely used this uh, always uh, for example developing our local control strategy in countries where I've been already uh, very present since already years before but also in countries where we are entering at this moment. We are working in different countries in Asia Pacific uh, but I would like just to briefly uh, focus in, in two countries in Taiwan and Japan. In the case of Taiwan, we are present thanks to a local company called CDWE, which was established already in 2018. Uh, but now we have continued working and we received different awards throughout this year. So CWE is our joint venture between Deme Offshore and the local company CSBC Corporation Taiwan. And the same strategy has been for Japan, where we currently have established uh, some time ago, actually a couple of weeks ago, uh, Japan Offshore Marine. It's our joint venture in Japan between Deme Offshore and Penta Ocean Construction, local marine contract. So in both cases, we are talking about permanent local companies. These are not uh, project joint ventures or, or temporary joint ventures, 
these are permanent local companies with local assets and local personnel. So we are in Taiwan to stay in Taiwan with this company and the same for Japan. Uh, but of course, uh, apart from the resources and apart from the knowledge, what we need is to have a good combination between those two. And that's why we see a perfect combination in this, in this local setup, because we are combining our expertise with all the local knowledge of our local parties. And at the same time, we are also developing a strategy regarding dedicated offshore wind equipment. And, and that's what we, in our opinion, uh, being local means. Uh, and then, yeah, that's what we have done in Taiwan, for example, with our vessel Green Jet also. Um, for us, this is our main asset, which we are currently building in Taiwan. We will start works in 2023, and the Green Jet will be the first Taiwanese vessel dedicated fully to offshore winds, currently being, as I said, in, uh, in Kaohsiung here in Taiwan. We will use the vessel, of course, for all our activities uh, in Taiwan as from 2023, but we will also use the vessel in the rest of the APEC region, uh, primarily for foundation installation, but also we will look into uh, additional scopes, for example, turbine installation, uh, turbine installation with a floating vessel uh, in Asia Pacific. This is the case of Taiwan, but we will do the same in Japan, where we are uh, planning to transfer certain DME assets to the uh, to the joint venture, and uh, so that they can they can fully work under the same um, the same regime uh, in countries like Japan, where we have uh, certain cabotage regulations. So this is the second topic, but of course, apart from uh, the local uh, the local knowledge, where we would like to to also focus is in uh, in the technical parts, in uh, in new technologies and new techniques, because there is where we have done quite some progress also as Demi Offshore in 2021. And we think that we could bring quite some added value also, uh, in my case, for the Asia Pacific region, but also for the rest, rest of the areas worldwide, um, thanks to different techniques which we are currently developing. Uh, the first one I, I want to briefly mention is our expertise in drilling works. Um, for us, for Demi Offshore 2021, uh, is the year in which we reached a very important milestone in this regard, because uh, in 2021, we have installed the very first uh, Excel drilling monopile uh, for offshore winds in the world. Um, our vessel innovation started work in, uh, in France, in the saint Nazaire wind farm, a few months ago, installing monopiles where have to be drilled. And today, more than half of those locations, more than half of the 80 locations are already completed. Uh, nobody has done this type of works in the past, and this is something which we proudly say and we will continue, of course, doing it and finalizing the work during the coming months. Um, how we have done this, this has been achieved thanks to a state-of-the-art equipment, which we have fully designed and fully fabricated specifically for this, uh, for this project. Uh, apart from the drilling machine, uh, also regarding the whole structure that we have fully designed integratedly for the project in order to withstand the loads of the, uh, the environmental conditions of the Atlantic Ocean. So um, even though the conditions are quite extreme and challenging for both the vessel, but also for the, for the equipment that we have used, um, yeah, we are basically uh, progressing very successfully and, and we see this as a, as a technique which can be definitely used in other areas uh, with very challenging conditions throughout the world. Um, apart from drilling, I would like to briefly mention also uh, another technique. Uh, I'm talking about suction pile operations, which can be used definitely in offshore wind and also in floating, uh, floating technologies. Um, we are focused lately in these alternatives because of the acquisition of uh, SPT offshore, which is now 100% uh, part of, uh, of the DEMI group. This technique can be definitely uh, be a, a good asset for um, a good option for offshore wind in terms of, for example, installation of suction bucket jackets. We see suction bucket jackets being installed now in Europe, but also other areas here, even in, uh, in Asia Pacific, are considering uh, installation of suction bucket jackets for offshore wind farms um, with, with clear advantages, for example, uh, yeah, reduction of installation durations, but also uh, it's, it's, uh, the, the advantages in terms of environmental conditions, uh, re re reduction of noise, etc., and so on. So, um, we definitely encourage all the offshore wind players to explore this possibility and, of course, to assess the suitability of this technology for the, uh, for the different sites. Um, and, yeah, with this reference to technology and with innovation, uh, yeah, this brings me to the end of my presentation. So, once again, thank you very much for your, um, for your time. And, and if you have any questions, please, I'm happy to, uh, 
to answer you together with my with my two colleagues. Um, okay, great, uh, perfect. Thank you very much. Um, thank you very much um, for this insightful presentation, uh, Javier. And it was great uh, to hear about the key principles in the Asia Pacific. So now we have approximately 15 minutes for the Q&A session and we received quite a few questions. So maybe the first question will be for all three of you, since it's a general one. And um, what surprised you during the 2021 um, for in offshore wind development in either positive or not so positive way? Maybe we can start with Javier, then Holger and Marco. <laughs> Um, well, in 2021, I've, uh, of course, as been discussed with, uh, with my two colleagues as well, we were all waiting to see how 2021 was going to be after the, the crazy year we had in 2020. Um, there was a big challenge, at least in the area where I'm working now. COVID is still very present here and certainly in Taiwan. So um, I think we were all very doubtful about what was going to, to, to happen this year. but but. Positively, we have seen that there are much uh, more developments coming and there will be uh, a lot of developments continuing throughout the, the next years as well. So my main, main conclusion is that COVID has not stopped these markets and this business uh, totally the other way around and we will continue in a, in a much stronger way, continue with the same business. Okay, thank you, Javier. And I would, I would support that message, um, saying that our industry is, is going strong and it's, it's continuing on its pathway to deliver fairly cheap electricity. Um, I think we have seen many examples in the, in the past uh, year uh, with regards to auctions or with regards to commitments um, that, that uh, keep up the promise that offshore wind is, is a very cost-effective source of energy. Is also a large source, and I think that that those two elements, being cost-effective and large, will will make sure that offshore wind plays an increasing role um, in um, in the entire energy system. And um, it's it's basically coming look at from a from a European perspective, but I think the same applies to many other countries. It's it's one of the few technologies where you can definitely install a large scale because you have the size the size. Uh, on the turbines and the, the sites available where you, you are able to deliver that and um, and that is is something that we have seen in many occasions this year. I think those, those are the promising signs that I've seen maybe in a, in a positive way surprising me that this this development has been so rapid and so sustainable over the last years. Okay, thank you very much. Holger, uh, Marco? Yeah, I think uh, when we look at what 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 happened in uh, in bottom fixed uh, wind, of course, it sets a, a good example and and path for uh, for floating offshore wind as well. We have seen how uh, how costs in in bottom fixed uh, wind have uh, have come down. As we all realize, the LCOE of floating wind is still high, but we know what what happened with bottom fixed. So this gives a lot of confidence of of going down the same curve as was what happened in in bottom fixed. And of course, this this needs to happen with uh, with scaling up. And, 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 and this is what we're starting now. We, as a floating wind industry, I think we have everyone's attention uh, now, and now we have to make sure that we, uh, that we prove it, that we can also bring it to, 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 uh, to the large uh, scale. So that's the biggest uh, challenge. I mean, I've been with Principal Power for a little bit over a year now, and it's amazing to see the momentum gaining in the, in the industry. Uh, how we maybe when I started had to uh, look for opportunities and now as, as mentioned there are many more develop, uh, developers now entering the uh, uh, floating offshore wind uh, industry so we see a lot of more opportunities and uh, and even have to uh, yeah start focusing on, 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 on projects now to make sure like okay uh, we want to do the uh, the bigger wind farms uh, we want to focus on the on the projects that uh, that really have a good chance of succeeding and really get to see the steel in in the water because after all that's what we we want to achieve as a company so yeah the great uh, challenges and uh, ahead and very exciting uh, years to come for sure okay great thank you very much um and actually the second question would be more specifically for floating we have a few questions regarding floating and maybe we can discuss this uh, in more detail 
what you can share uh, based on your um, knowledge and uh, vast expertise. What uh, what kind of the most important development happened in the floating offshore wind? Also, there are questions more special one. What is the minimum water depth for the floating offshore wind? Uh, and um, yeah, come questions like that. And uh, I understand that maybe some of you have deeper knowledge, some not. But um, if you would like to share, please um, do that. And maybe this time we start with Marco, then Javier and uh, Holger. Okay, very well. Uh, yeah, if we if we look at uh, at water depth, uh, we we don't see any any challenges in uh, in increasing water depth. We are already looking in studies for uh, for wind farms in in Hawaii, for instance, with water depths over 800 meters, and uh, the technology that we use still applies there. I think where we see a challenge is more like how shallow can we uh, can we go because as as we know some some sites around the world have challenging soil conditions so maybe where you would expect a bottom fix technology being used uh, in terms of water depth uh, maybe it presents a, a challenge there so that's where we also see uh, initiative in questions like okay how how shallow can we go with with floating uh, with floating platforms so very interesting to see uh, to see that also different applications of, uh, of floating wind, of course, in, in electrification of, uh, of oil and gas platforms uh, to reduce the carbon footprint, and also, of course, hydrogen production on the, on the wind float. Um, what, what was the first question again? The first question, just in general, what do you yeah. think were the most important developments during the 2021, which are important to mention maybe and learn something from? Now, like I mentioned before, we see a lot more appetite now from uh, from, from different developers. Not only the, the the smaller developers really looking for uh, to get site control and develop the, the the projects from there, and then and sell out their stake. But we also see now, of course, the the, the Scotland round the rounds in in Brittany all focused on uh, on, on floating wind. So that's a, that's a big challenge in uh, or a big uh, big change what we see now in the uh, in the industry these kind of projects materializing the bigger size uh, projects coming to the to the market and also uh, much more appetite from uh, from the supply chain because they recognize the potential of what uh, what floating wind uh, can bring to uh, to the services. Uh, so that's that's all great to see. Like I mentioned, we now have to live up to the expectations with uh, bringing these uh, these wind farms to uh, to large scale. Yeah, great. Thank you very much, Marco. Javier, would you like to add something? Yes, indeed. So, 2021 for me, uh, in terms of floating, has been a bit the year in which we have uh, has been a big change. I think because we have really seen floating entering into a phase of of being considered uh, as a commercial uh, activity, not not uh, demos, not only pilot projects. Uh, there has been countries in which we only thought they were going to be pilots or demos in the coming five, ten years. Uh, and we have seen announcements already for big commercial scale projects uh, in, in, in the coming years. So uh, that's the case, for example, of South Korea, where we clearly see that, that uh, floating will be a, a very big market there. Uh, countries like, for example, Japan or even Taiwan, not in the maybe coming two, three years, but in the end it will also come. Uh, floating will play uh, definitely a, a very important role in the coming actions and in the coming uh, awards from the government for the next round of projects. And in terms of water depths, I, I, I fully agree with, uh, with what Marcos said, that it really depends on the site. We have seen sites in which a floating can be considered with water depths where still fixed foundations are also possible because of the site conditions are maybe not ideal. I'm thinking, for example, sites where there is a big, uh, a big challenges thing, uh, because of uh, earthquakes, for example. So I think definitely floating will play a big role even in, uh, in water depths where even fixed foundations could be considered a certain stage. Great, thank you very much, Javier. Uh, Holger, would you like to add something on this question? Yeah, I think the, um, this year has, has um, shown us a more clear path to um, floating offshore and becoming becoming really interesting, becoming a sort of economy of an economy scale, economy scale, so that that will allow the industry to to develop. Um, uh, Mark already mentioned the Scotland auction, um, certainly the French auction. This will provide the framework that will allow the technology 
only technology as such to further develop and, and come closer to um, uh, to prices that are um, interesting. Uh, we're not there yet. None of the, the structures that we see currently in the market can compete with, um, with let's say, a fairly cost-effective monofile foundation in, in, in shallow water depth. But it's a trend that, that will continue to grow in this as we go to deep waters and uh, potentially with uh, larger turbines. It is certainly um, positive that this is a development that will Okay, great, thank you. And actually, um, there's a question specifically also tied to floating, and maybe some of you, if you have experience with that, a person asks, um, um, does the panel think we will also see adop uh, the adoption of concrete floating wind platform? So if any one of you have any experience, please uh, let uh, the audience know. Well, I can, I can, I can pick up on that one. I think the... Um there is certainly a market also for concrete platform. Uh, it a little bit depends on how, how the market is actually framed. Um, if you have an environment with a fairly specific re requirement for localization, there might be an added value for concrete as such, um, uh, because if you don't have enough steel yards where you can actually deliver the, the steel components from, that might be might be a relevant, relevant factor. It pretty much depends on the logistic, how you, you, and how you can produce that. Obviously, these are very heavy and, and um, uh, sometimes complex structures that you need to you need to be um, thinking of, and they need a tremendous amount of space in the fabrication. Um, but certainly, I believe that in some areas um, we will see concrete foundations also developing. I see. Okay, Javier, Marco, would you like to add on this question, or yeah, we good? Probably the wrong guy of course but uh, yeah what we see now is a lot of different technologies out in, in the market a lot of companies are trying to uh, to enter with, uh, with floating technologies and and, and, it, and now almost create a lot of noise uh, in the industry because it is uh, like I mentioned in my presentation the, the interface between the turbines and the, and, and, the, and, and the floater is very important and time-consuming so if all the turbine manufacturers need to accommodate all those different designs out there, I, yeah, that will be a challenge. So I would expect that uh, turbine providers will uh, will focus on certain uh, technologies. Of course, the power is well positioned in that uh, in that area with the maturity of, of the technology. Uh, but yeah, I, will, I expect there will be uh, various uh, a number of technologies out there, and it will depend on certain project constraints or locations. What will be the be the best one? I mean. I would like to see wind flows uh, all over the place, but I recognize also that maybe certain uh, technologies have certain advantages in certain markets or project environments. So yeah, that's that's what I will uh, probably will see. I mean, I'd love to have a sneak preview now, ten years uh, down the road, to see what it looks like. It will be uh, it will be uh, exciting, but for sure there are uh, other technologies uh, as well and. Uh, all have their pros and cons, and we will see what uh, what is the most efficient one in uh, overall in, in certain conditions offshore and in certain markets and uh, supply chains and local content regimes. Okay, great, thank you, Javier. Would you like to add something on this? Very, very briefly. Um, yeah, a bit in line with what my colleague have said. I think there is a market of both. If I compare a bit steel with concrete, there is a market for both of them. And it, it will depend, in my opinion, of, of two or three things. Indeed, what is the supply chain doing? Countries where a big supply chain steel, I think that will definitely be uh, to be considered. Also, local content requirements, as Google already mentioned. But then uh, ports, port, uh, uh, port activities, as, as Google mentioned also, you really need store uh, store space there but also uh, we see some countries where uh, ports is a big constraint already for bottom fixed foundations and certainly for uh, for floating will happen the same so i, I think these these key topics will uh, will uh, will yeah create a bit of the decision whether a certain country will go for uh, for concrete or steel structures great such an interesting discussion and we receive a lot of questions in fact but the time is uh, is over unfortunately so uh thank you very much for all of your answers and sharing views today during this webinar final for this year um please join us next month 
uh, the following webinar will be held in January, actually on January 19th, the same time. And the topic on the webinar is offshore wind, uh, wind um, technology updates. So uh, once again, panelists, thank you very much for your time, Javier, Holger, and Marco. I wish you a wonderful uh, holidays uh, ahead of you. Enjoy your time with family, significant others. And also thank you, audience, for joining. And likewise, all the best and have a great day. Thank you very much. Thank you, thank you very much.